Today I want to give you my next to the last talk. This one is called Tea and Cricket. It's a little bit different. There's not going to be any war in this one. Uh, there's not going to be anybody <laughs> oh, trying to kill each other unless you are a very serious cricket fan or very strong, have very strong feelings about how tea should be prepared. But uh, the reason why I'm doing this somewhat lighter uh, talk today is because I've been talking a lot about how the confrontation of cultures has happened over time, particularly between Great Britain and India or the entire Indian subcontinent. When we say the entire Indian subcontinent, we mean pretty much everything south of the Himalayan mountains, um, as far over as the edge of Afghanistan on one side and over to include Burma um, or Myanmar, etc. on the other side. So more than just the country of India, but we're talking about tea and cricket because I think these are two examples of how the cultures not only uh, came into conflict with one another, but how they actually affected one another. How there was a, a lot of cultural cross-pollination between the British culture and the cultures of the Indian subcontinent. Um, I, I think that we're going to look at tea as something that began in South and Southeast Asia, China as well, and then greatly affected Europe and Britain and even North America, the rest of the West, and then cricket as something that came from Great Britain, it is the national sport of Great Britain, the United Kingdom, and then talk about that. And if you know nothing about cricket, I will tell you about cricket in terms of basic rules. If you start asking me for subtle interpretations of rules of cricket, then I'm going to say I have no idea because I, I don't come from a country where cricket is, is well known or popular, which is kind of strange because the United States is one of the very few colonies or former colonies of Great Britain that has not adopted cricket as a major sport. I'll talk about that when I get to cricket, but uh, I will see the conversation by saying that the first international cricket game ever played was between the U.S. and Canada in the um, 1800s. So we'll, we'll get back to that. But first I want to talk a little bit about tea. And, and before that, of course, my last talk will be in two days, our last sea day, and it will be a talk that those of you who have continued, uh, who started in Athens, you will already have heard this lecture called Understanding Islam. I've had one person tell me they wanted to come back because there's a lot of details in that talk and they wanted to hear, hear it again. But um, we'll basically look at the history and beliefs of Islam and hopefully I will be able to dispel some of the myths that are very, very common amongst North Americans especially. But we'll, we'll talk about that, okay? First we want to talk about tea. Um, tea is the second most popular drink in the world after water. People, more people drink water than anything else, but after that tea is a very strong second. Uh, tea is made from the evergreen shrub that is native to Asia, the um, Camellia sinensis, and it's native to not only China, which is where it really began, but also after tea, after they started exporting tea, some Indians said, wait a minute, we have that same shrub growing wild in our forests. And so it turned out that there may have been ancient drinking of tea in India as well. But while it originated in southwest China, for a long, long time, tea was seen only as medicinal beverage. It was drunk for medicinal reasons. Later on, in the Tang Dynasty, they actually began drinking it because they liked it. And so it became a recreational beverage. It was not introduced to Europe until the 16th century, so the 1500s. The Portuguese first brought it to Europe, uh, Venice and some of the other cities that they were trading with. And then it wasn't until the 17th century that it came to Britain. So in fact, um, the, the introduction of tea as a beverage to Western Europe and to Britain specifically comes fairly late. Um, six, 1600s is fairly late in the whole, whole historical process. Um, when I talk about tea, there's two sort of major categories. There is true tea, which is made from the Camellia sinensis plant. And then there are herbal teas, which may be combinations of various other flavorings, things like rose hips, chamomile, um, uh, others, even various kinds of spices, pepper, 
uh, cinnamon, cardamom, uh, oil of bergamot, which is the primary thing that makes Earl Grey tea, Earl Grey tea, Earl Grey hot, you know? Um, so no Star Trek fans? Earl Grey hot? Uh, never mind. Uh, so that's a Star Trek thing. Anyway, the, uh, so the idea is you've got herbal teas, which may have a base of black tea, but then have other things added, or they may just be the other things, chamomile, etc. But then within the true black tea categories, or within the, the categories that are made from the tea plant, um, we have a green tea, which is the leaves of the tea that's unwilted and unoxidized. And the various kinds of black tea, uh, is black tea is the means from the plant, uh, are based upon how it's processed. What do they do to it before you actually drink it? Green tea is just the leaves that are then steeped or even boiled in some countries. There's white tea, which is wilted, but it's not allowed to oxidize. Any plant like, I mean, you've, um, you've cut up apples before and let them sit in a bowl. What happens to them? They turn brown, right? That's an oxidation process. The same thing happens to leaves. And so some the variations of whether the leaves are allowed to wilt, whether they're allowed to oxidize, gives you green tea, white tea, oolong tea, which is also crushed. Um, black tea, which is called red tea in China, which is wilted, fully oxidized, allowed to fully brown, and then sometimes crushed. Yellow tea, which is unwilted but allowed to turn yellow in oxidation, and then fermented tea, uh, where they actually allow it to ferment so that you get uh, some of the sugars that are natural in turn into an alcohol, uh, so which is a, a very popular tea in China. So you've got all these different categories and kinds of tea. Um, uh, of course, in the United States, you have um, instant tea, which most people in Asia and Europe would say is not really tea. Um, that, that's, that's not uh, tea at all. I made the mistake very early on in my career traveling. I was working for an international relief and development organization, and my first trip to London, I made the mistake in a London restaurant. Um, they asked me what I would like to drink, and I said, um, I'd like a glass of iced tea. Well, I got a very puzzled look on the face of the waitress, and a few minutes later, I realized I could overhear just over a, a very short distance from me, the waitress, the maitre d', and one of the chefs from the kitchen are standing at this, this prep center discussing how it is they're supposed to make iced tea. They had no clue. Uh, and they're saying, well, uh, how much ice do you put in it? Is that enough? Should we add more? Is the ice supposed to melt like that? You know what? And they're going on and on trying to figure out how to make iced tea because in my ignorance, I didn't realize that at that point in time, which was quite a few years ago, iced tea was not drunk either. Tea was drunk pretty much with a little milk and sugar um, in Britain, which has always been the most popular way. But in terms of production, China is the number one producer of tea. It is the place that tea as a commercial beverage originated. There was a short period of time in which India actually took over as the number one producer, but then China surged ahead for the very simple reason they have more land that they can cultivate with tea plants. Um, India is the number two producer of tea in the world, and they are, uh, they don't export as much because they drink 70% of what they grow. India is uh, the tea drinkingest country in the world in many ways, in terms of gross, uh, but then they've got such a huge population. Currently today, India grows about 30% of the world's total in tea, uh, the largest consumer, the second largest exporter. By far the largest consumer of tea, well, they drink about a, a pound of tea per person per year in India. In Great Britain, they drink um, in excess of four pounds by weight of tea every year. So. If, if you're British or have British friends, then you understand that. The first thing that happens in the morning is you want a cuppa? You know that expression, cuppa? Meaning a cup of tea. Um, and this is something that is, is very, very common. Early on in the Indian drinking of tea, it was used again, as in China, for primarily medicinal purposes, and it became part of the, the Ayurveda um, health practices. Are you familiar with Ayurveda? There's actually a commercial beauty line called Ayurveda. But Ayurveda in India is a very ancient, they actually believe that the gods gave the wisdom to the sages who then passed it on to the people as to how to maintain health. And uh, significantly it had to do with mixing of various herbs, they began to drink tea as part of the Ayurveda, and then different things added to the tea, like pepper or cardamom or various spices, licorice, mint, 
that would create different health benefits, and that became part of their belief. Um, while India had some native tea growing, they discovered later, before they really realized it a commercial product, it was introduced to India by the British East India Company. And the reason they did that is because of the, the dependency that they had on buying tea from China. China had a monopoly on it. And I mentioned to you before that the, the income that the British were receiving from the sale of opium to China offset the cost of the tea. Well, opium was made illegal. They fought two wars to try to force China to allow opium to be, to be sold there. But then as the demand for tea grew and grew and grew, they didn't want to rely on, on India as, or China as the monopoly, so they introduced it in a cultivated way into India. Um, and so the earliest reference we have in India to the drinking of tea is from the uh, Ramayana. Ramayana, you will remember when we talked about the Hindu faith, is one of their oldest. It's from 750 BC or so. There was a reference to drinking tea in the Mahayana. But then for almost a thousand years later, they kind of lost it. Uh, they, they stopped drinking tea. But in the 1820s, the British East India Company did bring tea seeds. They actually brought 40, uh, 2, 000, well, 80,000 seeds to India from China. They planted them. They got 42,000 initial seedlings and began the cultivation of tea in a commercial way in India. And uh, that has become, to this day, tea is second only to the national railway system in India as being the largest em employer um, in the nation. So a lot of people are involved in the tea industry. How many of you all went to the tea plantation um, in Sri Lanka? Okay, we're sort of including that because, uh, and it was a fascinating, uh, fascinating experience. The uh, Sri Lanka was included in all of this because Sri Lanka at one time, when it was called Ceylon, and you know about Ceylon tea, um, today Ceylon is still a major producer of tea in the world. Uh, behind China and India, I believe Ceylon is third. Kenya is up there as well. Kenya has really risen in recent years, so that they're a major producer as well. But um, Ceylon tea, we visited the Sri Lankan tea plantation and they talked about the differences in those and how it was processed and all of that. In India, tea is consumed both in homes and outside. Along the streets in any city in India, there will be a regular tea stall. The people who run that are called chaiwalas. Chai is the word for tea. To many people, chai has come to mean the spiced tea that you get, which has milk in it, etc. But originally, it was called, uh, the, in India and in China, uh, it was called chow or chai or te, and then eventually to tea and to the British. So these very ubiquitous tea stalls in India, you can, you can drink tea everywhere. There was a real push. See, initially they were growing tea in India, and they didn't drink it very much, not until um, really, the, the almost the end of the, the 19th, start of the 20th century, the tea producers realized, hey, we've got almost 300 million people in India. They're a huge market for this stuff. So the tea companies that were run by the British started offering free tea to Indians. They had horse-drawn carts. They would offer um, free samples of tea. Just realized we got a lot of a lot of light over here from these these windows. Um, is that okay? We have no problem with that. Um, so they, they started having horse-drawn carts and they would give free tea to the Indian people and they even convinced the various industries in India that they should give people a break and at the break they should offer them tea because tea was a stimulant. It's, it doesn't have nearly as much caffeine in it as coffee does, but the stimulant supposedly helped them to work. And so um, it became so common that it started to be drunk not only in tea stalls, around the streets, but also they started preparing it at home. Now again, there's a lot of different kinds of tea that is drunk. In India, they are very big on what's called masala chai, which is black tea with which they mix various uh, spices, aromatics, as I say, things like green cardamom pods, cinnamon sticks, ground cloves, ground ginger, black peppercorns, any number of things. Um, all spice is used in the West in the same kind of thing. They can use cinnamon, cloves, all of these things added to the tea in order to give it other flavors. The British, from very early on, they started adding milk and sugar to their tea. And then when they started marketing it to the Indians, that's how they began to drink it. And that was sort of the basis of the early masala chai. In fact, the very best kind of tea in India 
is tea in which the black teas and some of the other additives are actually boiled in milk and then water is added later. Um, so they, it's a process called decoction is where they, you know, they actually boil the tea leaves and any other ingredients in the liquid. They don't steep it, they don't uh, boil the water and then pour it on the leaves and let it steep and then pour it out. They actually boil it all together. And this is the most common way that it's done in this part of the world. In terms of the influence that it had on Britain, obviously tea is the quintessential English drink. I mean, people think of the British and they, they think of beautiful um, tea sets and you know people who hold their pinky out when they drink which is considered completely wrong that's com poor etiquette you're supposed to have all your fingers curled in when you drink tea don't ever stick your pinky out when you drink tea all right especially not if you're in britain so in the mid 17th century it was introduced to england um in to at first they people didn't catch on to it but it became more and more popular particularly in the 1660s charles ii's wife Catherine of Braganza, who was Portuguese, you will remember that at that time the Portuguese controlled uh, Bombay. And Bombay was donated by Catherine of Braganza as a wedding gift to her husband Charles II, the King of England. And at that point she had been, you know, she had been associated with India. <clears throat> she loved tea, she was addicted to it. She really was responsible for introducing it as a, as a drink of high culture in England. And in fact, when it first started being drunk in England, it was drunk in coffee houses. And um, it, it's they had a real problem with it at first because so many men would go to coffee houses and drink tea that there was a huge drop in the drinking of gin and ale in England. And there were protests by the gin producers and the ale producers because these men were drinking tea and they thought it was a manly drink. Well, Catherine of Braganza comes along and she advocates it as a drink for women. And so rather than just going to these coffee houses and drinking tea, uh, women started gathering in, in their parlors together to drink tea and it became a major center point of the social life of women in Britain. And then they began to develop tea shops. Actually, the first time that happened is a woman who ran a, uh, a bread shop started offering tea as a beverage to people who visited and they liked it so much she began to make that her focus and eventually you have these tea shops where people will go for afternoon tea they will have tea and crumpets or sweets uh, a little jam um, you get this kind of thing that people you know crumpets and tea um, the, the very reason for the development of these beautiful ceramic tea sets in England was because they needed something to drink tea out of um, the all of the the Wedgwood and Spode and the other major porcelain companies, the Chinese drank tea from a cup without a handle, almost a saucer. And the British wanted something that seemed more appropriate to them, and so they started looking for fine uh, cups with handles they could drink tea out of. And that led to the whole porcelain industry. So tea started the porcelain industry in Britain. Uh, they also, the, the Americans had invented um, a very fast kind of ship called a clipper ship. Well, the British figured out that while it had taken a long period of time by ship to get tea from India to Britain, these ships were much faster. The clipper ships, the Cuddy Sark is the most famous one. It's, it's still uh, on display at Greenwich in England. If you go to, um, if, if you have to travel that far, it costs a lot more money the longer it takes to get it there. So they introduced these very fast ships and then a lot of people use those ships in smuggling because when tea became very popular, they started taxing it. At one point, they were charging 119% tax on tea. And at that point, they started smuggling it because they could make a really good profit. Later on, they wised up and they cut it to like 12.9% tax in Britain. And it was legal, people could afford to do it, but it still was very expensive. In fact, at one point, one of the biggest coffee houses in London also sold dry tea and they were selling um, the a pound of dry tea was costing 10 pounds British sterling and 10 pounds at that time was a huge amount of money I mean it was like more than a month's wages so very expensive the whole tax on tea thing those of you who are Americans know about what happened 
one of the big events that led to the Revolutionary War was the Boston Tea Party. The, the government in, in Britain, in London, started charging a huge tax, and, and because they, most of the people had come from uh, England, they were tea drinkers in the United States. Well, they were charging such a high tax that we ended up with the Boston Tea Party, where a bunch of Americans dressed up like Native Americans, like Indians, uh, you know, feathers not dots, as a friend of mine used to say, um, and dumped this tea in Boston Harbor. And so you wonder now why coffee is a more common beverage in the United States? That's why. Uh, because of the conflict they had with the British government over the cost of tea and the taxation on tea. And, and they were all saying, forget it, you know, we'll drink something else. How about coffee? And so we became very much a coffee drinking culture as opposed to the places that we came from. Um, I think that's probably all I want to say about tea at this point. Um, as I mentioned, tea became so much a part of the British culture, they currently drink in excess of four pounds per person per year. Um, unfortunately for the tea producers and sellers in Britain, it has been dropping significantly. In fact, since uh, 2012, the consumption of tea in Britain has dropped 20%. They're saying that now, like last year, it dropped almost 6%. Younger people are not drinking as much tea, um, and so they, they're seeing a sharp decline in that. They're drinking much more herbal teas, which are not black tea based, so that's not part of the tea industry, or you know other kinds of beverages. They're drinking more coffee in Britain. Um, they're, or Red Bull for young people, all kinds of different things, but tea is not something that they're drinking as much of. But it is one of the ideal examples how, despite the dominance and the sort of, um, cultural prejudices that Great Britain had, that they were superior, tea is something that they very much received as an influence from first uh, China and then especially from India. Now I want to talk to you about cricket. Here's a quote from the official rules or laws of cricket. In the introduction it says, cricket is a game that owes much of its unique appeal to the fact that it should be played not only with its, within its laws, but also within the spirit of the game. Cricket in Britain, and in terms of its influence throughout the British Empire, uh, historically, is more than just a game. Uh, it is the uh, official sport of the British Empire, and to a great extent, the playing of cricket was a mark of whether or not a country had been part of the British Empire, the United States being the single exception to that. But every place that the British Empire established a colony, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, India, Canada to some extent, uh, all of those places, you can almost say any country that has cricket as a major sport was part of the British Empire, and it came from there. And <coughs> cricket, as this indicates, <coughs> was much more than just a sport. The ethos, the etiquette of cricket came to be synonymous with what the British considered appropriate gentlemanly uh, conduct. A lot of expressions have grown up out of that. Um, you've heard the expression, well that's just not cricket, right? That's because cricket players are expected to conduct themselves as gentlemen or as ladies because there's now you know women's cricket as well um, and to do anything that seems to be in any way off color or inappropriate or inconsistent is not cricket. Interestingly enough a number of the colonies, when they were fighting for independence from Britain, they used that very analogy to the British when they felt the British were being unfair and how they were treat, being treated, that they were not being consistent, they were not being gentlemanly. And so in India especially, they would say, wait, you know, that's not cricket. They were using the British's own etiquette ideas of, that are exemplified in this game to tell them that what they were doing did not seem to be appropriate. There are other expressions as well. You've heard the expression, well, that's a sticky wicket, right? Wicket is like home, in, in, in cricket, is like home plate in, um, in baseball. baseball. And it's three posts that are driven into the ground, and then on the top of those posts are two small pieces of wood. I'm going to show you some pictures called bales. The, uh, the bowler, or the, which is the cricket name for the pitcher in baseball, Baseball and cricket really are very similar. You wouldn't think so on the surface of it. As one commentator I heard one time said that baseball 
people who love baseball will also love cricket, but not at first sight. You know, you have to you have to figure it out a little bit. But the a sticky wicket would be one in which the bails are very difficult to knock off, or in which the the pitch, the main center area where most of the play takes place, where it's if it's muddy or if it's difficult, then you have a sticky wicket, a, a problematic situation. There's also, particularly more in Britain, uh, somebody if they're speaking of someone who has died, they'll say, well, he had a good innings. And innings, which is both a singular and a plural word with an S on the end, and innings in cricket is one round of all of one team's uh, batters having gotten to bat. And when they say that someone had a good innings after they've died, it means they had a good life. You know, they did well in their life. Um, so there are a lot of these kind of factors that the British have passed on to the rest of the world in terms of the ethos of cricket. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more as we go along. But first, how many of you know anything about cricket? Five of you. Okay. That's not unusual in a crowd that comes from where we come from. This is the pitch in cricket. I'm going to show you a, a map of what a cricket, uh, cricket field looks like. The main players, in terms of activity, are the bowler. He is the equivalent of a baseball pitcher. Um, the differences are that he doesn't have to stand in one place with his foot, you know, his, his back foot on the rubber, which, you know, a pitcher in baseball, it's illegal for him to, to move off of a center place. In cricket, the bowler will actually run up and get momentum. And this is why they, um, even the, and when they throw the ball, they throw it overhand with a stiff elbow. They're not allowed to bend their elbow. Um, very different than the motion of a baseball pitcher. But when they throw the ball, and the ball is, is very similar, usually they're red, but they're very similar to a baseball. They have a rubber core, they're, and then they're wrapped in leather, and they're hard. In fact, there have been a number of cases in which people died by being hit in the head with a cricket ball. Uh, Frederick, the Duke of Wales, was killed by being head, uh, hit in the head with a cricket ball in the 1750s, and that's why George the Third um, or George the Second became the King of England, which later led to the American Revolution. It might have been a very different world had Frederick not been killed by being hit, hit in the head with a cricket ball. So they throw the the bowler, and the reason they call him a bowler is because in very ancient times, the cricket uh, uh, bowler would bowl underhand, and he would roll the ball. And I'll show you in a minute the, the sort of development of the cricket bat. The original cricket bats looked more like a hockey stick because they were striking the ball off the ground. Later on, they, they started doing it roundhouse and then overhead, again with a stiff arm. They also bounced the ball once. The ball is struck as it bounces off of the ground. And this, this central area here is called the pitch. And it usually is clay with maybe a light uh, grass over it. So he is on the, um, the defensive team, the bowler, the, the equivalent of a pitcher, he has, this is the umpire standing behind him. The, uh, in addition to the bowler, there is the wicket keeper who is the, the equivalent of a catcher in baseball. He's the one that receives the ball, and, and then there are nine other fielders like these guys. Now, imagine, this ball is as hard as a baseball and about the same size. It's about to be hit by that bat, and cricket is not in a, a field like baseball. You can hit a cricket ball 360 degrees in any direction. And in fact, one of the reasons a cricket bat has slight angles on one side is that that assists in being able to hit the cricket ball in any direction. Well, um, if you can imagine a fielder in baseball standing that far away from the batter, without a glove. The only person that wears a glove in cricket is the, the wicket keeper. And these guys, and, and uh, again, as one commentator I heard said, fielders in cricket expect it to hurt when they catch the ball. That's just part of the game. So they have nine fielders which are positioned around this field tactically based upon who the batter is and what their tendency is. Do they tend to pull the ball to the left or, you know, are they more trickier than that. This is what the batter looks like in a cricket bat. This is what a bowler is looking like as he winds up before he comes overhand. Um, and so he um, bowls the ball. It bounces once. The striker, there are actually two batsmen. They're not called batters. They're called batsmen. 
there are two batsmen, the striker, the one who's going to hit the ball, and then you notice this guy's also got a cricket bat. They stand on either end because they're wickets on both ends. That's what a wicket looks like. Three, uh, three wickets driven in the ground and then two bales on top of them. And there's three ways that they can score. If the batsman, the striker batsman, hits it in the uh, outside the outer boundary, in the air, you get six runs. If he strikes it outside those boundaries on a bounce or on the ground, he gets four runs. If he strikes it and it's being and it's being fielded, and he feels that he can make it, then he will run up to here. There's there's there are lines four feet in front of each wicket, which are you know he has a batting zone he has to stay in. This batsman will run to that wicket. This batsman will run to this wicket. And when they exchange ends, they score a run. And it's possible to get more than one run. If he strikes the ball and he feels like it hasn't gone far enough and he can't make it, he doesn't have to run. He just gets another another bowl. You know, they throw another ball. Um, so it's very different in those regards, but still the fundamental issue is somebody throws the ball, somebody hits the ball, and the person hitting the ball tries to score runs. So in those regards, and there are fielders, in those regards it's very similar. Um, there are three ways that the batsman can be um, out. He can either hit the ball in the air and have a fielder catch it in the air. He can, um, he can allow the ball to strike the wicket. You know, there's here, you can't hardly see it, but there's one that looks like that. If the bowler is successful in striking the wicket with the ball and knocking the bails off, then the, the batsman is out. Um, or if he gets what's called leg before wicket. In other words, if he allows the ball to hit him, before it strikes the wicket, hit his body, not his bat, then he's out. Um, and you'll notice where he's standing, you know, they, they will stand right in front of the wicket. A pitched cricket ball, the fastest pitcher in the world today, or bowler, I shouldn't say pitcher, the fastest bowler in the world today, is able to, to uh, throw the cricket ball right at 100 miles an hour. And they actually stand blocking the wicket. Um, you know, they are different techniques. But that's why they can't allow themselves to be struck by the ball without it striking the bat, or they're out. Well, an innings is when all 11 of the offensive team, the batsman's team, all of them have had a bat. And they can score 175 runs during that. And then that's one innings. The second innings, then, is the other team comes to bat. Um, the, the bowlers are allowed to throw six, um, six times, that's an over, and then another, they switch ends and another bowler comes up. It sounds awfully complicated, it's really not that different than baseball. Um, they have, generally they have uh, two innings, and, well, they have four innings in the, the test match play, um, and an innings can last a day or more. Uh, in test match, which is the traditional form of cricket, a, a cricket match will last five days, six hours a day. They'll play for six hours and then break to the next day and come back. Um, they then, in 1963, they introduced a limited overs version of it in which they only play two innings, that is, each side gets to about once, rather than four innings. Um, and so it's a shorter game, it's a faster game. They've introduced some other rules that make it a little bit quicker and it is, it is revolutionized, revolutionized. And then they have a version of that called 2020, which is where they get 20 overs or 20, 20 uh, different pitchers, and then they switch, okay? So, um, but it's not that unlike baseball in that you throw a ball, you try to hit the ball, you try to make runs. This, as I say, is what it looks like. This area, the square area in here, it's hard to see, is the pitch. So you've got a batsman at one end, and the bowler at the other end, and he can run up to his given line. Um, and then you've got fielders, which are arranged in 360 degrees around them. Obviously, there's generally a more of a concentration on the in front of the batsman than behind, because it's harder for him to hit the ball behind him. But um, it is one of the most popular games in the whole world, certainly in all the areas where the, the British have been involved. Now, there's an interesting um, aspect to cricket in, in Britain, and that is the difference in an amateur and a professional. In, in America, 
amateur and professional, whether you're talking about sports or something else, have an opposite meaning to what it does in Britain. For instance, if somebody does a really good job professionally, I mean, a really good job in their job at work, you'll say, well, that was a thoroughly professional job. Very professional, that was a compliment. If they don't do well, you might say, well, that was really amateurish. That's exactly the reverse with regard to sports in Britain. To be a professional is considered, uh, to be paid to play the sport is considered um, mercenary. It's, it sort of cheapens it. It's not as worthwhile. For 150 years, up until the 1960s, the all-star game in Britain was called the gentlemen versus the players. The gentlemen were not paid. They could be reimbursed for their expenses, but they were not paid. The players were the professionals, and it tended to be the professionals were the ones who did not have enough income from other sources. They had to be paid to be able to, to play this game with any seriousness. The gentlemen all were from landed gentry or some, had some other source of income, so they could play just for the fun of it. And it was considered much more honorable, much better, much more uh, a source of pride to be an amateur player than to be a professional player. Probably the greatest player in the history of the sport, W.R. Grace, uh, who played in England. He started when he was 14 and he played until he was 40, until he was 60, excuse me, uh, 46 years. He was so proud of the fact that he was never paid. He was never a professional. He was always an amateur. Now, they would be reimbursed for their expenses. And they say that, you know, they're, they, um, sometimes had very creative ways of submitting their expenses. And so, because of that, they say that W.R. Grace probably made more money than most of the professionals, even though he boasted till his dying day that he had never been a professional. He had always been an amateur. So there's a very different idea about that. And that, that difference in concept, that amateur is better than professional, the British give that as a reason why they've never done as well in international competitions like the Olympics. Because they say, well, amateurism is, you know, it's very British, and so we don't have all these professionals playing for us. Um, and it's a very different kind of idea. These are bats, cricket bats. And you will notice that the early cricket bats, if you can see this down here, had a curve at the end. They looked like a hockey stick or a field hockey stick because the ball was hit off the ground. The bowler bowled underhand and it was hit off the ground. Eventually, they began to take on more of a straight form, and so now a cricket bat looks very much like this. Um, it's, it's wider and flatter than a, a baseball bat. It does have sort of angles on one side, which gives the ability to hit the ball in different directions. Um, and cricket, as I told you before, cricket became a symbol for etiquette, for um, appropriate action. Um, in, in many ways, that it was a, the gentlemanly thing. It's uh, throughout all of British history, cricket was the only sport that really was across class barriers. Soccer or football was very much a, a sport of the lower classes. Upper, it was not played upper class in you know the, the public schools, which means private schools in Britain. Um, in, the upper class would play croquet or tennis or golf, and think about it, tennis and golf require very expensive maintenance of lawns and courts and things like that, so only the upper class could afford that. Or, you know, fox hunting. Those are all upper class. The only thing that really bridged that was cricket, because like the all-star game was the gentlemen versus the players, and that almost, as a matter of, of necessity, meant those that were wealthy versus those that were, those that were poor. Many cricket fields, their facilities, they would have two different dressing rooms, one for the gentlemen and one for the non-gentlemen, for the players, because they were a different social status and they should not intermingle in that way. Um, in fact, the, the, the point that this crossed over the boundaries of social class and really allowed an interaction that otherwise was, was frowned upon one commentator said that if the French nobility had been capable of playing cricket with their peasants, their chateaus would never have been burned. <laughs> Meaning this was the only kind of interaction that they had. The French didn't have any of that interaction, and so they, they, saw, uh, they saw a difficulty with that. Um, so one of the things that, that has also made cricket very popular around the world, and 
as, as we drove around in some of the places, did any of you all see them play cricket in the streets? We saw four or five different places. In India, there were kids playing cricket in the streets because the only thing you really have to have is a ball, and, and if necessary, you can make a ball by winding cord tightly together, and a bat, and you can use a, a piece of, any kind of piece of wood, even a, it's like stick ball in the early days in America. That was the street version of baseball. They would use a broom handle. You can use anything that, you, you know, a piece of plank, and you don't have to have, the rest of it you can make up. You can say, okay, here's one wicket line, and 22 yards away, here's the other line, and that's what we're running between. We saw children in several places in India playing. In Sri Lanka, was it Sri Lanka, I think? Maybe it was still in India. We saw men playing. And they were just out in the middle of kind of a square, and they'd have to get out of the way when cars came through. But one of them was pitching or bowling. Um, the other was the batsman, and he was hitting the ball. Um, and so you see this everywhere, because like stickball in the US, you don't have to have a lot of equipment to play this at its most rudimentary form. And so that's another reason it's been so popular, and because it's popular for the lower class as well as the upper class, it's played everywhere by everyone. This is what, by the way, the wicket looks like. This doesn't have any bales on top of it. Ordinarily, they have two pieces of wood right there. But the ball is thrown overhand. And there have been, cricket is so seri taken so seriously that there have been instances where there were international diplomatic crises caused by this. In the 1930s, the, um, the Australians had the man who was unequivocally the best batsman in history. His name was Don Bradman. We have Australians in the group. Yay, Don Bradman! Don Bradman is considered probably the greatest um, sportsman of any sport ever. I mean, he is beyond the beyond Gretzky in hockey. Um, to give you an idea, the way they calculate batting average, uh, batsman average in in cricket, typically for somebody who plays uh, league play, they'll have anywhere from 20, which is low, to 40. You know, they don't do it in the hundreds, 20 to 40. A, 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 a batsman's average of 50 is considered extraordinary. Don Bradman had a batsman's average of 99.94 in test match play. No one has ever come close to that. Well, in the 1930s, there's a, a famous uh, match called the Ashes, which is a competition between Britain, Great Britain, and Australia. And the first time, for when they started this, for a, while, a long time, the English won. The first time the Australians actually won, a sports commentator in England wrote a little note and said, yesterday, English cricket died oh. because the Australians had won. And he said, um, the funeral is being attended by many fans and supporters. The body is to be cremated and the ashes returned to Australia. <laughs> And that's where they got the term, the Ashes. And so the competition every year between the Australians and the British is called the Ashes. And it's a huge competition. Well, in the 1930s when Don Bradman was by far the best batsman in, in the world, and still to this day, they think he was more dominant in his sport than any sportsman in any sport ever. And the, uh, the British, in order to try to counter him, started pitching or bowling, excuse me, I keep flipping into, into baseball terminology, they were uh, bowling the ball down shorter, pitching short, so that it then would bounce up head high. Mm. Well, this ball could travel up to 100 miles an hour. And they were intentionally, they called this you know, body line bowling. They were throwing it in such a way that it was an imminent threat when it got to him. Usually, when it bounces, it bounces at waist high or somewhere about that. So they weren't; in, they in no way were trying to hit the wicket. They were trying to hit Don Bradman. Well, there was a formal protest from the government of Australia to the government of Britain over the fact that they were doing that, and they had a diplomatic strain over this technique they were using to try to to overcome the effectiveness of the best batsman that had ever lived. Uh, so they take this very seriously, don't they, Australia? Okay, as I told you, one of our guides in um, in when we were in Sri Lanka said, uh, or I'm sorry, in India said that we don't care if our cricket team loses to anybody else, to Canada, to Kenya, it doesn't matter, as long as they don't lose to Pakistan. And it's like that's because there are political ramifications to all of that. So this is cricket. 
I'm going to stick this up here because I've only got two more opportunities to show you. If you've missed any of the lectures or you want to see any of the other lectures that I've done, that's the address. Any questions about tea and cricket? Yes? Question on cricket. Okay. The derivation of it, do you know what the derivation is? Where did it come from? And what? And, and the other part is, uh, was there other other activities within Europe or was was this did this expand out into or was it from Europe it started in Britain okay uh, in we we believe that it may be older it started as a children's game they think and by the 1600s it was very popular um, it began to be played in schools the earliest references we have to it are children playing it that's why we think it started as a children's game and then it went out from there when you say derivation do you mean the word cricket or the game the game itself the game. because yeah. I saw uh, etching by by uh, Rembrandt mm -hmm. where it's called golfer but it's it's a uh, it looks exactly like one of those early wickets right hmm. well the, the there are a lot of different games that fall into the category of club and ball games you know um, you have categories where there are uh, a fit, uh, opposite teams like baseball um, cricket etc then you have some where it's a uh, club and ball like golf where there's an undefended um, and so there's a number of different games that fall into that club and ball kind of category but it did begin they believe with children um, in before the 1600s in Britain and then went out from there yes it's a bet normated by the size the bet oh is the, it, it's uh, the size is it normated it's there, there are regulations in terms of bats just mm -hmm. as there is in baseball as mm -hmm. to how big it can be etc yeah. you most of them are made out of willow There are standards and again one of the things about cricket and i started out with that quote is it's not just what's what the rules say but there are aspects of conduct that are just expected gentlemanly conduct and the umpires have a right to call the captain to deal with an issue even if it's not a violation of the rules a good example of that was one of the early Australian teams that's, that started traveling. The, some of the players that were very, very good were Aboriginal players, and they, they didn't wear shoes. Well, because it was considered ungentlemanly not to wear shoes, they were told they had to wear shoes, even though it's not in the rules. So even things that are not in the rules, there are still rules. Okay, yes? What is a century? I don't even know. What is a century? A hundred runs? Okay. Okay, a hundred runs. Thank you. Thanks. Um, back here. Uh, there was a comment. In order to protect themselves from injury, the English in the 1800s developed to protect the, the genitals of the men, a triangular cup called a protector. Right. It took 100 years. In 1987, they woke up that they should protect their brain. Okay, have you all heard that? He said that, that um, in, the eight, in the 1800s, they developed, in order to protect themselves, they developed something to protect their genitals called a cup, or protector, which they have in baseball as well. And it wasn't until 100 years later they decided they needed to wear a helmet to protect their brain. <laughs> the suggestion is that where's our priorities? Uh, but yeah, they are allowed to wear protective gear. The batsman, um, well, just the batsman, he wears some protective gear, and the the wicket keeper wears protective gear, but um, for the most part, as I say, they don't even wear gloves in terms of the fieldsmen, uh, the, the fielders. Yes? Uh, just an addendum to the, the team, uh, history of the team. I think in the beginning, when, when British was importing tea from China, the only currency they allowed to have is silver. Silver, okay. And they used silver with silver until they almost depleted the entire silver reserve, yeah. they realize they are in trouble. So they introduced opium uh -huh. to China to offset it. <laughs> so that's a sort of predecessor of this uh, trade, opium right. trade. Okay, yeah, but they, 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 they were using hard cash and not recovering it in terms of silver, and so they had to make up for that. Any other questions? And then we need to end because they need to come in and, and clean up. Yes? Thank you. 
British accent. It's a nasty blow. Yes. <laughs> it's a nasty blow when you get hit with the ball. Plus, you're out. I never, I never heard what really happens. I never got my answer to yeah. that question until now. It's Thank called you. an LBW, a leg before wicket, which means if you allow yourself to be hit with the ball, not the bat, but if it hits your body, then the batsman is out. Okay. Um, we need to close this out because they need to set up for the, uh, the cooking demonstration. If you have other questions, please come and see me, and I'll see you in two days for our last lecture.